Ready? Okay, very good. Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Thank you for coming. Um, also, thank you to those who are joining us, in, not only in the audience, but joining us here via our district's YouTube channel. So, right now, we'd like to say the Pledge of Allegiance. If you're wearing a hat, if you could please remove it. And join me in saying the pledge. Glad you go with that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Jessica, may I have a roll call of trustees, please? Trustee Bush? Here. Trustee Duty? Here. Trustee LaMarco? Here. Trustee Law? Present. President Sheps? Here. Trustee Spencer? Excuse. Trustee Young? Here. Six present, zero absent, one excused. Okay, thank you. I'd like to approve the agenda now, so we have a motion to do so. So move. Second. All in favor? Uh, motion carried. Uh, brings us to our first order of business, which is our building updates. We'll start with the high school, Mr. Lupini. Thank you. Good evening. For the DePew High School updates, I would like to introduce Joey Manna, our freshman class president.
January 13th was the spelling bee primarily final. And congratulations to Grace Stuber on winning the spelling bee. January 19th is the middle school slash high school PTSL meeting in, in the high school main office at 3.30. January 28th is the end of the second quarter. Go Bills! Can I just ask her where she got that sweatshirt from? It's awesome. <laughs> Okay. All right. Thank you. We shop there all the time. <laughs> I am tonight. <laughs> yeah, school bills. Uh, King of Heights school bills. I would like to introduce fifth grade student Byron Black. Good evening. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, our school nurses, Megan Stablewski, Lynn Martin, Nancy Fayette, and Julie Smith have gone above and beyond serving our school community. They have assisted in reviewing our reopening plans and taking every student's temperature each morning. They've evaluated students and staff for COVID-19 symptoms. They have counseled parents on a regular basis about the proper quarantining rules, and in some instances have been faced with highly emotional conversations. They have, trained, they have trained to administer COVID-19 testing protocols in December of 2020 in order to be able to provide testing to a random sampling of students and staff in January of 2021 in the bus garage so that we could get back in, to in-person learning after being put on a full remote status. They continued their daily um, accounting of students infected by COVID-19 along with identifying close contacts in the fall of 2021 and reported them to the Erie County Department of Health and the New York State Department of Health. Additionally, they had to account for vaccinated faculty and staff and then set up weekly testing for the unvaccinated. Finally, along with overseeing all of these COVID-19 protocols, they have been attending to their normal school nursing duties. First to be recognized tonight is our high school nurse, Megan Stablewski, who could not be with us tonight. But Mr. Lupini has shared that Megan has demonstrated grace under pressure as she has navigated through a multitude of different roles and responsibilities. Throughout the pandemic, Megan is the first face our students see as they enter the building. She is the main point of contact for our students, staff, and families as she provides answers and clarity for their COVID-related questions. She has had to research and stay current of the constantly evolving guidance from the Erie County Department of Health to ensure DHS is keeping its students and families safe. Although under an extreme amount of additional stress, Megan always has a smiling face and exhibits a good sense of humor so that all around her feel welcome, safe, and comfortable as she assists them with any health-related needs. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Next, Lynn Martin. Since Lynn is here, she has to stand and be uncomfortable. <laughs> Lynn is our middle school nurse. Ms. Girdlestone has shared that Lynn has been an integral part of the middle school, our district, and the Western New York community. Lynn manages all the day-to-day -day health and wellness operations in the middle school, such as screenings, physicals, immunizations, as well as the 
influx of everyday student needs. She has taken a lead role in navigating through all of the COVID mandates and regulations, making it possible for us to continue to stay open and provide quality education. She is involved in every aspect of the school community. You will find her at grade level meetings, school dances, the NISPO competitions, field trips, basically anywhere you find middle school students. Above all else, you can find her every morning at the front doors, greeting the students with a smile, a positive affirmation, and a supportive hand. You can count on her to be there for the students, teachers, and staff, and parents whenever the need arises with advice, support, and sometimes just an ear. Thank you, Lynn. can't do these separate because they're dynamic duo apparently. So now on to Julie Smith and Nancy Fayette. If you could please both stand. These, these young ladies are Kegel Heights Elementary School nurses. As Mrs. Kuga states, the dynamic duel of Julie and Nancy at Kegel Heights is irreplaceable. Few truly comprehend how the role of the school nurse has changed over the past 22 months. In addition to their caregiver and traditional roles, they have taken on many additional responsibilities, such as contact tracers, de-escalation specialists of emotional parents when they receive quarantine or testing news, COVID testers, master of accurate records related to quarantine and return to school dates, COVID support specialists to staff students in the greater community, experts of ever-evolving New York State guidelines and regulations that change at a moment's notice, and skilled temperature checkers. The list could go on and on, but most importantly, Julie and Nancy have worked tirelessly to make sure that we are operating within the health guidelines to keep our students learning in school. They have not missed a beat and have been, a, um, been at the heart of keeping our students and staff safe during the pandemic. We could not continue to do this without them. Thank you, Nancy and Julie. Again, the dedication of all four of our school nurses is to be commended and recognized. Thank you. Assessment audit from Tricone Cigar and Associates. Mr. Mark Firm is here. Hi, Mark. Great, thanks. Does, uh, does everyone have a copy of our draft report? Yes. I think I'd like just to address the, the board with the, with the summary of that. Um, you know, each year the district uh, hires us to perform an annual risk assessment on uh, various operations of the district. And as part of that risk assessment, which is summarized uh, here in this report, you know, we look at a number of different areas, and you know, our process typically entails inquiry of management, um, taking a look at past uh, findings from either internal audits or external audits, uh, discussions with uh, Ms. Arena and her team as to you know, their views on various risks. And so the culmination of that work um, is you know, summarized in this report. I'd like to get a little bit of a, a, a more detailed view of the process that we go through. Start on page one, kind of talks about all the different uh, types of factors that we do look at. And then if you turn to page, page two, or all the significant areas we look at, these are pretty, pretty consistent from district to district. Uh, we do about six or seven districts, uh, this process, so these are very typical uh, for, uh, for districts. And then turning to page uh, uh, three, is sort of a graphical uh, description of the results of our risk assessment. So if you have that in color, if not, uh, uh, the top right is the, are the higher risk areas that we view. 
the ones in sort of yellow or the middle are our moderate risk and the ones in the lower left in green are our low risk. And so what we normally ask the board is after reviewing this uh, initial risk assessment, uh, the next step would be is for the board to select one high risk area for us to do more detailed testing. That is to be in compliance with the New York State Accountability Act or what's referred to as the five point plan. We're required to do at least uh, one uh, area where we do more detailed testing. So um, after this meeting, if you want to circle back with Ms. Arena as to what area you'd like us to test, uh, we appreciate that. Those two high risk areas are cash management and human resources. Um, so again, if you provide us that feedback, we would we'd appreciate that. Any questions or? Yeah, I have, I have one. Sure. In uh, the cash management says, segregation of duties risk. Are you talking about the fact that there's fewer people being segregated? These individuals are handling too many things. And that's yeah, risk you know, in, in, a, in a smaller organization uh, like the business office, especially with smaller districts, it's really difficult to segregate duties. You have a you know, small number of staff, and so it's a very typical risk that we see in districts. And then turnovers mentioned in both. Is that more a historical risk that you guys have recognized? The more the turnover, the higher the risk, or is there a specific risk? No, nope. yeah, whenever there's turnover, it's typically it's indicative maybe of a higher risk um, because of uh, change in um, you know, change in, uh, you know, what, what, what folks are doing internally. You have new staff that come on board that may not know the procedures as well. So that's a, that, that's a generic, sort of a generic risk, risk, if you will, yeah. yeah. Nothing, nothing related to specific. Yeah. All right, thank you. We've had, we've had three in that department. Right, I know we were in the department. I just didn't know if it was uh, historical or based on uh, yeah, institutional and knowledge right. loss. Yeah, institutional know, knowledge, yeah. And so HR and payroll is uh, almost always a high risk area for districts. It's typically on average 70% of a school's budget. So just given the dollar amounts and the risk involved in payroll, usually so it's, it's usually not a high risk area. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, Ms. Arena would agree, and, and I would recommend the board consider having the auditors take a look at cash management for, for that, for those very reasons for this year. That's so great. We'll, we'll endeavor to, to do that. We're, we're, we're working with Ms. Reno over the next couple months and, and might no, report okay. back to the next uh, board meeting. Okay. So uh, as a board, we, should, we need to get back to Dr. Reno with our recommendations. Okay. We can do that by the end of the week. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank Appreciate you. It. We can clap for you, too. We don't want to make a feel darn the party. We just don't have flowers. Thank you. Appreciate what you do. All right. We have a presentation from K-12 Special Education. Sherry Barsatelli and Christian Good evening, my name is Jill Chinochka, Director of Special Education for DePue School. Um, our Special Education Department coordinates a wide range of services for students starting at age 3 and continuing on for some to age 21. While it's very difficult to take a snapshot of everything that's going on in the classroom and community, Sherry, Kristen, and Erica, in conjunction with fellow teachers, have put together an overview of in-class and related services that are being offered kindergarten through 12th grade. I'd like to thank the board, Dr. Ravy, and the community for continuing to be so supportive of all of our programs. I'm confident in saying that DePue has some of the best special education teachers in the field, and I'm so proud and appreciative of the continued commitment to making DePue an inclusive community for all learners. I would now like to introduce Sherry Barsatelli, the K-5 Department Chair, to start the presentation. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, so as um, Mrs. Schmitzka mentioned, um, I went right to my colleagues when it came to, you know, what should we talk about. And we talked a lot about just the everyday things that we do that not everyone might know about. And I feel like it's been a long time since we've given one of these presentations, at least myself. I think the last one I gave, I was in a completely different role. So we talked about everything that we've been doing 
That is our high quality general classroom instruction. Um, and whenever I talk to the middle school and I ask, what do you want to make sure I teach fifth grade? And I always talk to them about what do you want to make sure that these kids come to? And they always talk about basic skills, get them reading and writing and doing math, and then we can keep going from there. So our high quality classroom instruction includes our reading workshop, where especially your students in your inclusion classrooms, where combined general education and special education students, they're learning grade level skills throughout the year, while we're then pulling those students into small groups and presenting them with their individual needs. We do the same thing in writing workshop, um, where again, students are being instructed in grade level writing skills, and when those students do have gaps, whether it be from their special education needs or some of the needs as a result of remote learning. Um, over the last two years, we're able to address those in small groups, one-on-one -on -one conferences, which you can see in some of the pictures. Building fact fluency. So we have our new kits that we call our VFF kits, and Mrs. Bash presented earlier this year um, for the math department about our building fact fluency kits. And it's really amazing to us how our students, all of our students can participate. From our littlest kindergartners who you know, already unfortunately have some learning gaps to our fifth graders who are closing those learning gaps. They're able to participate in the classroom discussion and the partner discussion. The partner discussions are rich and rewarding for the kids and for the teachers to hear the different ways that students are able to process and learn those facts. Then we have some of our specially designed instruction, things that we really just focus on our special education students for their needs, things like phonemic awareness. Um, many students naturally gain phonemic awareness. They can rhyme words, they can move um, sounds around in different words. Some of our students with special needs don't have those basic skills, and so we have to provide specific instruction on that. Same as with um, our phonics programs, Orton Gillingham. Um, very strategic step-by-step -step processes for our students to learn things that some students just naturally figure out. We also have all of our support services within our special education program. So we have our speech and language therapy that students receive throughout the school day. And um, our pathologists work with students um, and I love that they mentioned this because I took it out of our presentation, but one of the things that a lot of my colleagues and I talked about was the fact that all of these programs we have really work seamlessly between classroom and remote instruction. Goodness knows we don't want to go back there, but if we had to, it does work. Um, we have all of those things in place. And some of our speech therapists are still working with students through Zoom because of home instruction, because of other situations that they're dealing with, and again, targeting those individual goals to help decrease the learning gaps our students are facing. We also have our physical and occupational therapy department with, uh, with, with our amazing PTs and OTs, helping students do everything from your gross motor, your big skills, and being able to navigate the building safely to your fine motor skills, sensory integration, um, including in the one picture you can see our sensory hallways that all of the students can use when they need a break, when they need to you know, change their mindset, being able to do something very physical helps our students with that. And finally, we have our school counseling services. Um, I've been fortunate enough to work with all of these counselors in our building um, for many years. And um, it always amazes me when I'm stuck with you know, something that a student's going through that other people in the building that I can go to that are always available, that find a way to meet with our students. Um, we have school-wide initiatives, specific classroom lessons. Um, there's a lot of conversation with the remote instruction on social-emotional learning and just social skills and kids being able to go back to talking to each other rather than just on the devices and our, our counselors really support with all of that. Um, so we're very lucky for all the people we work with. Um, I'm very fortunate for my colleagues who helped me with this presentation. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good evening. Thank you for having us. I am Kristen Kachati. I am the Special Education Department Chair for 6 through 12. This is Mrs. Erica Gregoire, our school psychologist at the high school. And we are just going to highlight some things and some programs that we have going on that we would like to tell you a little bit more about. Here's the list of things that we're going to be discussing. So if you look at this slide, this shows our unified sports. 
Um, Unified Sports joins together students both with and without intellectual disabilities on the same sports team. It actually began through the U.S. Office of Special Education Programs at the U.S. Department of Education. It is a way to encourage social inclusion through sports. And as you can see by our pictures, we have a both a unified bowling team and a unified basketball team. So there are some pictures of some of our students. Okay, next I just wanted to talk about some of the transition services that we have um, happening at the high school. These are services that are typically um, in conjunction with an agency and help our students um, move from high school to a work environment, whether or not that includes a stopover in college. Um, so one of our first programs that we have is the Aspire World of Work program, or WOW. Um, again, this is through Aspire. Western New York runs the program. And what this program does is it takes students and puts them on a job site um, with just a, a couple other students and a job coach. Those students spend half of their day on the job site getting on-the-job training four days per week. And then on Fridays, they go to a class at the Trimane Building where they reinforce the skills that they learned on the job as well as develop and practice other soft skills um, to help them, again, be ready to transition to work. Um, another one of our programs is the Promote Youth Program. This is somewhat of a new program that we have here at the high school. Um, we just actually completed our first cohort group um, in December. We had started last year um, uh, all kind of online on Zoom through the pandemic, um, and then kind of finished up with the students this fall. But the Promote Youth is um, a grant that we had entered into with um, the ARP of Erie County, and it is a 16-week program, so 16 weeks of class. We run it once a week. Um, the new class that will be starting next semester will run during our um, actually Mrs. Kachati's ELA 10 class, as well as our 10th grade academic support class. Um, and they cover a bunch of topics ranging from self-advocacy, self-awareness, um, career exploration, job readiness skills. And again, just gets the students starting to think about work and the skills that they need to be successful in work. Um, hopefully then after they complete the Promote Youth program, we have them transition to our Steps to Work program. We've run Steps to Work now for, I believe we've had three groups go through. Um, Steps to Work is a program that is intended for 11th and 12th graders. Um, it is run as 10 weeks of class with the end goal of uh, obtaining summer employment. This is a program that we've partnered with Community Services for Everyone. They come in um, and teach the classes, and then the way that the employment works is they put the students on their payroll, they make connections with businesses in the community to have our students work there, and then community services pay, pays the students. And it's a great opportunity for students to get work experience, as well as for businesses to bring on potential employees and have the support of a job coach for approximately eight, 10 weeks of summer to get them started. And our ultimate goal, what we usually hope for, is that those businesses will see the benefit of having had those students there and then eventually employ those students themselves at the end of their, um, their time with the, the steps to work. And then our last transition program is just Access VR and just the availability of Access VR and that we, um, we continuously push that, um, that service for our students. Access VR is uh, funded through New York State Ed, it's a New York State Ed program, and it is for students in their usually 11th or 12th grade or within their last year before exiting high school. Um, and they are a funding source for services to have students be employed. So we very much encourage all of our junior and senior 504 students and students with IEPs to apply for Access VR services. We at the school coordinate um, getting, getting the paperwork, marketing the paperwork, talking to the parents, um, as well as coordinating their intake meetings and following through with their counselor through Access VR. And then once they leave us, their Access VR counselor kind of takes over. But they can provide a lot of services, including um, if you meet financial need, they will pay for college at the SUNY rate. 
Um, they can pay for driver training, they can do mobility training, they can do resume building, um, a whole bunch of different things to help our students be successful. So that is something that we are continuously um, trying to link our, our junior and seniors with. All right, thank you. Okay, and the last thing we have for you to take a peek at is our science field trip. So this was a field trip that Mrs. Owens Living Environment class participated in. Um, uh, at Como Lake Park on October 7, 2021. Uh, the students surveyed the area. They completed various water tests and some students and one teacher was actually brave enough to put on some waders and go into the water and um, dig out some water to look for any type of animal life that, was, um, that they could collect from the water. So you can see some pictures from that. Um, Mrs. Owens has been doing this field trip for several years, but with COVID and unfortunately um, kind of some crummy weather days, we weren't actually able to go out. We had to do it either virtually or do it in the classroom where our guides brought the water to us. So it was really special. We actually had an absolutely beautiful, as you can see by the pictures, beautiful fall day with just enough sun. And you know, we were wearing t-shirts and the kids really enjoyed being able to get out and have a little bit of normalcy back. And actually on the bottom right, you can see that's actually one of our DePew alumni that was one of our guides for, for, the, for the day. So it was kind of nice for us teachers to be able to see him and for him to see a little piece of DePew coming to visit him on the job. So, any questions? Any questions? Okay. Thank you so much, okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Please relay to your staff how much we appreciate what they do. Uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, each and every day. So I'll bring this to our first public forum. This is the time in the board meeting agenda when district residents may address the Board of Education with their concerns. Each resident has up to three minutes to address the board. A total of 15 minutes will be allowed for each public forum. Anybody here tonight would like to speak? District residents? Okay. Thank you. Next, we have our superintendent's report from Dr. Raby, the 2022-2023 budget. Hold on your seats, folks. Your favorite Dr. Raby didn't sleep all year, so he can do it. This week it was this, Bill Street. <laughs> exactly. The, the bills are number two. This is something else. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hold back your excitement. Okay, here's the 2022-2023 budget development uh, initial presentation. As always, we take a look at our reductions that we've had ever since the Great Recession back in 2010. Last year, we reduced our initial budget uh, by about $755,000. Um, at that time, uh, our enrollment was um, approximately 1,775 students. So since 2010, we have reduced our budgets um, to the tune of almost $10 million. Looking at our enrollment projections for next year using a cohort survival uh, method that we have been using uh, for the last um, 11 years, going on 12, uh, we're, we're looking at um, a bump in enrollment of about 40 students uh, to 1799, almost uh, up to, back up to that 1800 mark. Uh, this is the point in the budget development process that we look at um, and lock in our um, major budget increases in the uh, proposed plan. Uh, looking at our teacher's retirement system, looking at about a 13.98% increase, a little over $200,000. Employee's retirement system um, is significantly lower, um, $11,000 or 1.35%. And if the board recalls, we now have reserves for both of those retirement systems in case there is a significant spike so it doesn't um, uh, go back onto the, uh, the tax, uh, tax levy. Um, use it, uh, looking at our health insurance, this is probably one of the lowest that we've had uh, since we went over to self-funded, um, a 0.75%, um, a little over $38,000. When I first got here back in 2010, those were double-digit percentage increases um, that were definitely impacting, definitely impacting our budget. And if you recall, last year we had another victory. We now have a health reserve. So if we ever do down the road, uh, you get a spike in that uh, health insurance. We can tap into that reserve so it doesn't significantly impact the tax levy. And then the negotiated salaries with all the bargaining units and individual contracts, we're looking at an increase of 3.78%, a 
a um, little under $800,000 for a total increase right now of a little over a million dollars or 3.71%. Looking at the landscape for advocacy, again, looking at the sustainability agenda for 22, uh, 23, state aid, the governor uh, reaffirmed her commitment to fully fund the foundation aid by 23-24 in her state of the state address and again today in her budget presentation proposing the highest ever investment in New York State education of $31 billion. Uh, it, was a very, it, it was a very encouraging presentation today, probably by far the best I've, I've seen as a superintendent for 17 years. Uh, very excited about what the future holds for education and also um, health care for that matter. Um, there, there is a significant commitment there within the budget uh, plan. Looking at the tax cap, again, our advocacy is to amend the formula to support multi-year planning, allow for some more flexibility and exemptions within that tax cap formula. Always looking for mandate relief. Uh, maximizing our resources to benefit our students. Our fund balance, um, right now with the um, infusion of cash from the federal government with the stimulus and districts being in, um, most districts being in a sound financial uh, order, uh, we, we have been advocating uh, to um, bump up that unrestricted fund balance uh, from 4% to, 4 to 8%. And it's important to note that school districts are the only ones that have a cap on their fund balance amount. Municipalities do not have it cap. Um, so they, they don't have to follow the, uh, those same rules. So we are, we are advocating for this to get bumped up. And if the board recalls last year, we, you know, we're, we were um, advised to get that back down below 4% because we were holding on to that cash, uh, not knowing what the stimulus was going to look like, not knowing what we wanted to do with that cash before we put it in the reserves um, and become restricted. So um, that would be a significant um, benefit uh, to the district in the future. And then finally, the other one was the capital outlay projects. Right now, we're limited to $100,000 capital outlay um, uh, threshold each year. Uh, and those are those little tiny projects that we do, you know, the basketball nets, working on the pool, a uh, couple of small bathrooms. We're looking to um, advocate to get those at minimum two hundred fifty dollars to a maximum of $500,000. And then one of the other caveats with the capital outlays is you can only do it in one building at a time. Um, we're looking to uh, uh, provide some flexibility in that law to uh, allow to, like if it was $500,000, to span over multiple buildings rather than just focusing in on one. So those are, those are some of the, the key things coming up for this legislative session. And then as always, we always when, we, when we get to the point where we have to start talking about possibility of reductions, we always protect programming of students, we protect our class size, maximize our resources and efficiencies, review and evaluate needs versus wants, and review and evaluate budgeting and spending three-year trends. Our next steps, uh, right now we're going through our building and department budget meetings. Uh, we'll take a look at our first draft of the budget, first draft of our revenue side. Um, BOCES budget will be due, and then we begin to draft that tax cap. In February, we finalize our budget department budgets, determine our bus vehicle and equipment purchases, determine potential cuts, if needed, and finalize the tax cap. In March, we submit that levy limit to the Office of the State Controller. We es estimate the tax rate, finalize revenue, finalize potential cuts, update the Board of Education on the status of, res of our reserves. And then in April, we publicize the required legal notices. Board of Education adopts the budget, the levy, um, the pr uh, proposition language for the May vote. We prepare Board of Education resolution for the capital outlay project and the seeker reporting. And then in May, we have the public hearing on Tuesday, May 10th at 6.30 p.m. right here. And then uh, the budget vote is scheduled for Tuesday, May 17th from noon to 9 in the high school gymnasium. Any questions so far? Oh. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> Dr. Ravy, just want to let you know that, I'll, you know, Presentation was rippling through the community that Mr. Burkhardt, David Burkhardt, made it in tonight to, just, just to hear it. And they'll probably be at every other meeting for it. So I'll sign a copy for you, Dave. I got a question, but I, you know, I can wait until the next public forum. All yeah, right, good. Thanks, Dave. Okay. We have a motion of the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the consent agenda item as presented. So moved. Second. Oh, we, said, we have two so moves and a second. Yeah, it wasn't me. Amy, we give it to Amy and Nick or Justin and Nick? Amy and Nick. How about that? Thank you. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Uh, motion carries.
carry. I want to recognize uh, a couple of retirements here. Tammy Lynn Shiner, part-time bus attendant, has served us for 22 years. So thank you. I don't know if she's here this evening, but let's just give her a round of applause anyway. She can watch the video if she likes at the board meeting. Thank you, Tammy Lynn. And also James Stevens, who's that teacher at Hugo Heights, also 22 years. So wow, that's impressive and glad. A lot of students served and I'm blessed with his, uh, with his presence over that time. So thank you very much. Bring us to new business. Um, number one, I have a motion that it be resolved with the Board of Education by the recommendation of the superintendent and the district audit committee hereby accepts the independent risk assessment report for the school year 2021-2022 as presented by Tranconi, Segura, and Associates LLP. So, second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the first reading of District Policy 3220, public participation. So moved. Second. Any questions? I do. So I read through the policy. I don't know if anybody else got a chance to read through the policy. If we're going to have people sign in, when do they need to sign in by? So the district clerk can record that and then get that information to board members. As it's written right now, or initially, it's just before the board meeting starts, and that's not enough time, in all fairness, to any of us or Jessica to have that information ready. So do we want to have it by noon that day? Do they need to submit their request? We're gonna we're gonna make it split it, right? We're gonna switch board to board. I mean agenda topics and non-agenda topics. So that was that was the question. If we put the agenda out X right. number of days beforehand, then the people who want to comment on the agenda would have to see the agenda to comment to, to ask for it. Yeah, they'd have to be able to see it. So it's online. So we'd have to be that 48 hour period by close business Monday, they'd have to have their requests. In. And then for the non-agenda items, maybe by the meeting at the meeting. Can somebody just refresh my memory why this came up as a topic? To make Nick had brought it up. I just don't remember the rationale uh, why. Just to keep just to keep it more organized because of all the um, issues that have popped up at other various board meetings. This way, when, people, when individuals come in and they have concerns, we can have it more of an organized way. Because September almost spiraled out of control. Thankfully, everyone was coming to talk to our meetings has been very respectful. But for any topics that might come up in the near future or in the future, we can keep it kind of organized and know at the beginning of the meeting if we have to vote to have more time allotted or not. So we're not voting on the fly, so to speak. Like, um, well, we have 30 minutes allotted, so that's technically 10 people that can talk. So if there's a hot button issue and you have 15 to 20 people show up, you'd have to vote for more time on the fly for them to be, all be able to speak. Whereas if we knew ahead of time, we could vote ahead of time to allow for more um, time for public forum in accordance with board policy, and we'd just be able to keep it kind of more of an organized manner. I guess how I most wanna... is, so how, how, bleh, bleh, is how most of the districts in the area actually do it. Well, that's what, that's what I wanted to know, because I know when we came up with this policy 10, 11 years ago, it took us months to get it the way we wanted. So the rush to a change, I don't, I'm not extremely comfortable with. Well, we're not rushing. I know, oh, and I'm just, we're, I'm, we're, not, we're, I didn't say we are. Yeah, we're, 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 we're talking, Dr. Raby, uh, thank you, Dr. Raby, did, you know, drafted something for us to look at. We've had, we've approved the first reading of it. We're talking about questions, you know, right now in regards to that. Sorry, Chief. So we've had a first reading, all right? We've looked at that, we've approved that, we have some questions now. Do we want to change it? That's where we're at. Okay. How are we going to change it if we want to? I don't know if, if we need to make the decision and put in the policy that we're going to vote ahead of time. I think just knowing well, I think what he, no, knowing what's there would just allow us to have, you know, give us some notice as to what people would like to talk about. So we need to vote. We need to vote. But if we had like 20 people signed up, say, no, say, say for whatever reason, people didn't like the popcorn we were serving at the basketball games, and everyone's very passionate about it, 20 people came to speak about the popcorn at the basketball games. We would know ahead of time that there were 20 people, which is more time than we have allotted. We could have begin in the meeting and say, okay, we're going to vote to extend more time, which is in accordance with our board policy. We're going to amend the, we're going to amend the agenda, the to, agenda add more to get more time or 
opposed to we have five people speak, and then there's 15 more that want to speak about the popcorn at the basketball game, so we'd have to vote. We'd have to interrupt it and vote on the time to keep it going. We can always, we can always, always vote. We can always vote for the extension at the beginning to see the list. That's what I just said. Right. Yeah. That's but but, but in, in, to Justin's point, we haven't had we have we had one meeting in a long, long, long time that that fell under that, and we haven't had one since. So. I mean, I know at the, at the town level, they have people sign in when they come in that evening. Right. Um, ahead of the meeting, but there's no, like, what you have to, what you're there to speak on. But I do believe they have it set up that. Please. I do believe they have it set up, like, what you're proposing is that one comment, question, comment section is for agenda items and one is for not. Right. That I do believe. Beginning and end. But it's just simply, it's like at the top of the paper, it's, it's announced as people are signing in. Um, it's not like, I mean, you had mentioned us getting a list. I don't, if Jessica has a list of and people that have signed up at 6.30, I, I don't need a list. If we go back to the point of the public forum, it's not the building, it's not a Q and A session. Yeah. So, You know, it gives us an idea, I think, for time, and it also puts the people in the right bucket, right? If people just want to come and be mad, they can talk later. If they got specific agenda, things that we're going to vote on and want us to consider it, they should be put them in front before we're voting. It, yes, right. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the the idea here. Is I don't know that we need it in front. I mean, if they show up at the meeting, I think it's just about how's that going to look and. Jessica, is that doable in your estimation? Well, I think it depends on what the Board of Education is looking for. Are we looking to see how many people are talking or what they're talking about? So if I put the agenda out on Friday at 3 o'clock, normally let's say 3, 4 o'clock is when you get it. They have all the way Friday to Monday. I mean, they would have to by Monday by, I mean, I'm here till 4, so, and then Tuesday before I don't know is if we need to know what they want to talk about versus just the number of people that may want to talk. The only way we, we can have that is we, we can have that by the beginning of the meeting, and that way, we, that way we know. And you can control that by, like, for instance, if, if um, you know Dave Burker came to the mic and started talking about a, a topic in the first forum, but it wasn't on the agenda, you'd say, Dave, hold on, you got to wait until the second level forum because it's not your item, it's not on the agenda. So you can control it that way too, rather than knowing what topic people are talking about, you just simply have the list. The sign up. Right. I don't think the sign up is a bad idea right. at the door. I don't think that's a bad idea at all. But I think it's doable. And that would eliminate the having to announce your name and all that, especially now that we're not here. Yeah, could you name an address on the sheet? That way they don't have to say it. I can prefer that they're resident. Yeah. I mean, that would be. If yeah, somebody shows up and puts Ambers down, you can be like, yeah, and then they're also not announcing their address for all of our yeah. right. millions and millions of viewers. Well, I think too. you should at least have them address the cabinet. Maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can check it off on the list. Yeah. For sure. All right. Let's, um, so we're, we, we, both, we, we still got to do a second and third reading theoretically. You, you can sit with it until next month. I mean, yeah. You just, we don't need to do it until next month. I think signing up by, by start of uh, this meeting, you know, they have something there. Well, that's, that's the way it says right now. It says district residents wishing to address the Board of Education during any one of the two public forums will need to sign up upon arrival at the Board of Education meeting, specifically prior to the start of the meeting. But what you're saying is get rid of along with the topic that they will want to address. Correct. Right? I don't think that's necessary. So okay. Saying. Yep. I'm just wondering if, because we don't currently do it now, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad idea to open it up, they could submit their name and address that they want to speak or email a question, especially now that we're doing it virtual. On what did you say, Jessica? Friday, like Monday by four or Monday by noon? Like if they want, if they were going to watch virtually, right? And they're a resident and they want to ask a question, they submit their name and address with their question, whether it's an agenda item or not, or statement or whatever 
to you by Monday, say it, let's just hypothetically say noon, then it would alleviate this having to check email, or do we still have to do that because of open meetings off? Well, the, the issue with submitting questions, you're going to get into a Q&A. Yeah. That's well, you know, not, about. not necessarily a an inquiry about an agenda item. I, well, I, people can I, attend, so meetings are now open for them to attend. We were doing that before, using the laptop, when the people weren't right. attending in person. But now they can attend. Okay. So. I think we need to chew on it. Mm -hmm. All right. But, Jeff, thank you for the first up. Yep. I think it's good to have a list. No, no one wants to speak, and then we can go. I think it's good to have a list. No one wants to speak, and then we can go from there. At least the board will be informed if there is going to be an influx of people who want to talk. And by all means, we want people if they're, they're here, if they have something to say, we want to hear what they have to say. So we'll yeah, my intention of when I brought it up wasn't to limit, it was just to kind of keep it organized as right. we could. Right. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. We need to vote. We should probably. Um, Make a motion to table. Well, let's let's prove this one. We the, the, for the for, prove the first reading. We have questions. We'll prove that one. Then make a motion to table the second third reading. No, uh, to discuss it again at the next meeting. To discuss the second reading at the next meeting. So no, this, this one is just approving the first yes. reading. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. So all in favor approve the, the first reading. We already did that. Yep. No. All in favor. All in favor. I have Lamarca and Law. Lamarca and Law. Okay. All in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Motion carried. Now may I have a motion to table the second and third reading. So moved. Okay. Of, of this policy. So we review it further. Or recycle second. it to the board. Second. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carried. Number three, may I have a motion to the Board of Education upon the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the 2022-2023 duty. Union Free School District instructional calendar as presented. So, so one vote. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was Todd. In. Todd in there. Dick and Todd. Okay. Second. Got the questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Brings us to our second public forum. This is the time in the board meeting agenda. District residents may address the Board of Education with their concerns. Each resident has up to three minutes to address the board, a total of 15 minutes without reach public forum. Yes, young man, would you like to come forward? Thank you. Yes. Can you see right here? No. <laughs> no, we got to come up. We want to see you live and in person. Everybody at home wants to see, see you as well. If you are on camera, you weren't here. From, from, from what I've read in the papers, you know, you got to announce. You got to turn around, David. <laughs> Give your name and your address. Dave Burkhart, 5 Autumn Way. There he is. Thanks, Dave. Okay. From what I've seen in the papers and uh, seen on TV, um, this Build Back Better plan that the federal government has, it was supposed to have given every school district millions of dollars. Did the few get money from the government, and how was it spent? So we got two different buckets of money. We got the CARES Act and the American Rescue Plan. Right. So last year we built that into our budget plan for this current school year, and we um, one of the one of the biggest um, items was we hired six staff members to support our students in need, uh, two for literacy support, two for math support, um, a school uh, counselor, and I'm trying to think of the the, the teaching assistants. Oh no! It was the pre no. It was the pre first grade. Yeah. It was pre first grade. Uh, so what, what we identified was um, a number of students that were that were in kindergarten during when we were doing remote were not at grade level. So what we created was a um, intermediate grade between kindergarten and first grade, and we um, assigned a new teacher to that grade level, uh, that off grade level, to help those students get up to grade level. So if they, if they get up to um, their actual chronological age grade level, second grade, they can go on to second grade. If they still need assistance, they'll go on to first grade. Um, so that, that's what we did with that particular position. But we also uh, hired a school counselor to focus in on our elementary students and to build resiliency because of uh, the issues that uh, 
uh, were clearly apparent uh, during the pandemic um, and the, the deficits that they had in social and emotional. No, no, nothing was done as far as the uh, improving the, the ventilation. Like that, so that was a second pot of money that we currently have built into our capital project that we just passed. Okay. Uh, that's $1.7 million, and that'll go, it's, it's uh, grant money, so that'll go towards the um, towards the uh, uh, pricing of the HVAC for the air conditioning across the district. Okay, so, so the, the budget still went up, even with this extra money that was uh, given to the school district? Well, the, the budget still went up because that becomes part of your your. Uh, operating budget. So you're, even though you have the revenue coming in, your budget's still going up because you have to, you're paying, that's still an expenditure. Okay. That money was just utilized to offset that expenditure. No, no was any, uh, any, anything to do with the, the school buses at all? I, I know years ago you wanted to replace them every so often. We, we are. We still do that. We still do that every year. Okay. And then one more thing. As far as going to other board meetings myself, the first, um, a public forum is always about agenda items, and the second one is for anything that's going on. I mean, I couldn't hear some of this stuff. That's that exactly going what they were talking about. Right. Did that format. Okay. All right. Thank that's you. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, sir. That brings us to comments and remarks by board members. Any comments or remarks? Yeah, I um, just didn't say it earlier, but I've spent a little bit too much time with the middle school nurse this year <laughs> with my child. And just want to thank uh, the nurses and the leadership of all the schools, especially the middle school, because it's, it's been something. So it's good work. Just, just a, a reminder, I was helping Mr. Miller build some of the sets for the play and it's going to be fantastic as always, and uh, if you're free those nights and want to come take take a peek, then uh, we can take it. I guess it's all online now, uh, so you can see what tickets are available. I just want to plug the fourth and fifth grade musical that's at the end of the month for uh, Annie. And my daughter's play is uh, Annie again. Got the perfect uh, attitude for it. Put that on the record. What's the high school play? Susicle. What? Susicle. Oh, Susicle. Got it. That's March 19th and 20th. That'll be a new one for me. No, 18th and 19th. I just wanted just to uh, thank Dr. Ravi and his staff for all things COVID. I mean, not for the virus, but for everything. <laughs> everything, everything, a lot. everything the state he does with his staff and the communications to community, to the board, um, it's thorough, it's detailed, it's timely, and uh, we appreciate it very much. So, uh, at this point, uh, I know there are several students here that need some papers signed to get some credit. We want to help you out. Jessica will sign every single one of them for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, but no, the rest of them will help. Uh, may I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.